1. In American colleges, one student out of two still recently believed that cavemen had to defend themselves against dinosaurs. Prehistorians often deplore the ignorance of the public and express their surprise that even those who seem interested in the past are inclined to accept the most unsound ideas. Yet the struggle of humans against dinosaurs could be considered a kind of knowledge, one that is erroneous, rather than simply the manifestation of ignorance. An erroneous idea does not become less absurd merely for being shared by half the population, it becomes nevertheless interesting as a social phenomenon. In fact, the image of the caveman fighting dinosaurs is not entirely devoid of factual elements, nobody will deny that the dinosaurs really existed, just as prehistoric humans did. On the other hand, the origin of the deep-seated conviction that our ancestors shared the earth with the dinosaurs remains obscure, because human remains have never been found in the same geological formations as dinosaur bones, and no scholar has risked suggesting that our ancestors lived alongside these giant reptiles. It was non-experts, rather than scientists, who forged this idea, thus leaving us an excellent illustration of ordinary thinking at work. 2. Writing as we know it today was not a single technology, stemming from a single invention. It's a combination of various innovations which took place over a long period, with differing effects in different parts of the world. But the stages of evolution it went through, are very similar in all the different places. The earliest incarnations of all these writing systems were pictographic. They consisted of simplified drawings acting as stylized representations of concrete entities, a house, a river, a drawing of the head of a cow to represent a cow. As their use spread, so they began to accumulate broader meanings based on the context of this use, and to be combined together to create ideograms. Bird plus egg, for example, represented fertility. But the most significant stage in their development was, when they began to be used to represent not simply ideas but also sounds. Once this happened, writing could imitate spoken language rather than operating as a separate, parallel system of communication. It was this transition which led to the fully flexible systems we have today. 3. People tend to overestimate how harshly others will judge them. This dynamic may apply to the case of help-seeking. Even a small request can make the help-seeker feel self-conscious, embarrassed, and guilty. In our research, we have found that the anxiety help seekers experience over how their request will come across is surprising to potential helpers who do not know what all the fuss is about. In one study, we asked two samples of potential helpers, teaching assistants and peer advisors, to estimate the number of students who would seek their help during a single semester. The peer advisors overestimated by over 60%, and the teaching assistants by 20%, the number of students who would ask them for help. This prediction error emerged, even though the peer advisors had been students themselves the prior year, and the majority of teaching assistants had worked as teaching assistants before, often for the same class. Nevertheless, their past experience as help seekers offered no clues in predicting others' future help seeking behavior. 4. The effective use of time is one of the ultimate ways to display authority, even when you don't have it. Whoever controls time controls the situation in most instances. They will always remind anyone who wants to meet with them, that their time is valuable. However, there may be situations where you will want to reverse your use of tight time tactics. Let's say you have agreed to meet with one of your peers, to discuss a difficult situation that has developed between your two respective departments. You need more help from your peer than she needs from you to get things resolved, even though you've told her your time is limited. When she enters your office at the appointed hour, take your watch off ostentatiously, and place it face down on your desk. Say, my time belongs to you, for as long as you need it. Watch the cooperation level of your peer go up exponentially at the outset of your meeting. You'll be able to get anything you want from her. 5-7 There lived three poor orphans, 
named Havan, Mabel, and Anthony. They were siblings, and they loved each other so much. In their town lived Mrs. Annabel, a widow, who was the town's doctor. She was a lovely woman, but she had no children. Every morning Havan and his siblings would go to the town square, to beg for food and clothes. Mrs. Annabel loved Havan's little sister, Mabel, and gave her big apples every day. One day, Mrs. Annabel needed help to organize her garden, and Havan and his siblings offered to help. Together, they planted vegetables and flowers. Oh, they are so delightful, Mrs. Annabel said to herself. Havan and his siblings were very good kids, and they were loved by everyone in town. Then one day, Mabel became seriously ill. Havan carried her on his back and ran down to the town's clinic. Mrs. Annabel immediately took Mabel from Havan and placed her on the examination table. Little Mabel lay weakly on the table. I don't want to die, she cried weakly. Come on, baby, you will be just fine. Mrs. Annabel assured her. After examining her, Mrs. Annabel brought out a needle and an apple. She said to Mabel, I have an apple for you, but I'll only give it to you, after you receive this injection. Mabel looked at the needle with fright. I hate needles, Mrs. Annabel. I know, darling. But if you promise to be brave, I'll take you to my house and give you some ice cream. Mrs. Annabel assured her. Mabel lay bravely on the bed and allowed Mrs. Annabel to do her job. She eventually woke up feeling better. After Mabel's recovery, Havan went to Mrs. Annabel's clinic. Ma'am, he called out as he knocked softly on her door. Do you need something? she asked him. Thank you for taking care of Mabel, but I don't have any money to pay her bills, he spoke shyly. Don't worry, dear Havan. This one is all on me, Mrs. Annabel said to him. Havan thanked her for her kindness. Two months later, Mrs. Annabel adopted Havan and his two siblings. She loved them like her own children and took good care of them. She took them to the town school. They did well in school and won prizes every school year. Mrs. Annabel was proud of them, and they lived happily ever after. 8. Attitude polarization is currently increasing, at least in North America and Europe. The most important reason for the growing polarization, is probably increasingly selective exposure to information. People on both sides of an ideological debate, have no difficulty at all finding like-minded websites that support their viewpoints, often in even more radical ways. Getting in touch with others sharing their beliefs, makes them even more confident in their viewpoints. In other words, while one could expect that the availability of a broad ideological spectrum of media information could foster engagement with views diverging from one's own, experimental research suggests that it actually leads to increased effective polarization. People's in-group biases are strengthened by the new opportunities to get in touch with like-minded people. Confirmation bias influences which sources of information people utilize, in fact, there seems to be a vicious circle involved, increases in polarization cause stronger confirmation biases, which, in turn, lead to more biased information search. Elective exposure to political information is also increased by customizability technology creating so-called filter bubbles. 9. The desire to communicate is a part of being human. We have always needed to express ourselves but it took a long time before we could do so successfully. About 100,000 years ago, we developed the capacity to communicate, using speech. About 40,000 years ago, we drew pictures on the walls of caves. 
Through the ages, we've used various systems to send messages like smoke signals, semaphores, flags, pigeons, and human messengers, each of which had its own advantages and disadvantages. Each system worked when the conditions were just right, but was limited at least some of the time. For instance, smoke signals and semaphore systems did not work at night, because they depended on sunlight for the receiver to see the signal. Messengers were slow and could be captured during times of conflict or war. Pigeons could carry very small messages but were susceptible to natural predators and severe weather. 10. Is the brain an assembly of distinct components, each with a defined and separate function? One of the many difficulties in studying how the brain works is precisely, because it is not arranged in this way. That does not mean that one cannot assign specific functions to anatomically recognizable parts of the brain. Indeed one can, for example, the cerebral cortex that forms most of the outside of the brain and gives it its typically wrinkled or folded appearance, has areas that we know are concerned with identifiable actions. One is responsible for generating movement, another for analyzing incoming visual information and so on. Similar functional boundaries have been recognized in other parts of the brain. That is not an issue. What is, however, is whether there are clearly defined boundaries between these areas, either anatomically, where does one begin, or the other end, or functionally, is there a circumscribed area of the brain that has an equally precise function? The answer to both questions is a resounding no. 11. Social movements where a community expresses a desire for change, and all social life, are spaces of orderly interaction, operating through recurring practices. These routines constitute the group style. Actions are repeated and become accepted through that repetition. Individuals must be able to foresee the likely responses of others and adjust accordingly. I refer to these stabilizing forces as circuits of action. While these assumptions about how others will respond are sometimes appended, to be useful, expectations must frequently be met. Nowhere is this more salient than in social movements, where coordination is crucial. Interaction is filtered through the collective awareness of what participants believe is appropriate. Offering feeling words after meetings, typically positive ones, serves as a ritual that expresses both individual feelings and collective sentiment. Circuits of action incorporate the rules of the interaction order and the content of group cultures and practices that are anticipated and comforting. However, for interaction to be orderly within a collaborative group, negotiations and adjustments are essential, building relationships that are flexible but durable. 1214. On August 17, 2011, New York Giants quarterback Eli Manning sat for a live ESPN radio interview after his practice during the Giants training camp. When asked if he was a top 10, top 5 quarterback, Manning said, I think I am. And then when asked specifically if he was on the same level as New England Patriots quarterback Tom Brady, Manning paused and then said, yeah, I consider myself in that class. And Tom Brady is a great quarterback. Manning's statements touched off a lot of media excitement. Columnists and bloggers wrote at length about how indefensible Manning's opinion was. How in the world could Manning, with only one Super Bowl championship and MVP award and only two Pro Bowl appearances on his resume, compare himself to Brady, with six Pro Bowl appearances, three championships, and two NFL MVP awards on his resume. Brady was coming off an excellent 2010 season, throwing 36 touchdown passes and only four interceptions, while Manning had thrown a league-high 25 interceptions. How could Manning think of himself as Brady's peer? Fast forward from that training camp interview in August 2011 to February 5, 2012, to the conclusion of that season's Super Bowl. Eli Manning is standing at the center of Lucas Oil Stadium, lifting the championship trophy and receiving his second Super Bowl MVP award. Manning's New York Giants have just come from behind to defeat Tom Brady's favored New England Patriots. 
In the closing minutes of the fourth quarter, with the Giants losing, Manning engineered the 88-yard game-winning drive, making four crucial throws. Eli Manning showed the world that his statement the previous summer was simply the honest expression of a confident competitor. Even the additional Super Bowl MVP award hasn't stopped football experts from debating whether Eli Manning is indeed a top 10, top 5 quarterback in the same class as Tom Brady. Arguments about players go on endlessly. What isn't up for debate is that Eli performed at the highest level, in a very competitive profession's most demanding and important position for many years until his retirement. He made the best of his talent in his preparation, by building his confidence, protecting that confidence, and playing confidently. He became as good as he could be.